think that's really awesome. So because you give, we're able to give, and that's the beautiful partnership we have uh, here. We want to be the church, as we always say, in practical ways, and that's a cool way that our kids were able to do that last week. Now, if you've noticed in the video, when our kids were done checking out the Caremobile, they were all sent home with some fruit snacks. And I thought that Caremobile, uh, Ronald McDonald, missed a huge opportunity there. They could have sent everybody home with some chicken McNuggets. <laughs> And if that's the case, I, you wouldn't have seen me here in church last Sunday. I would have been out getting a 20-piece. <laughs> but what a cool ministry. What a cool opportunity we have to give back. And so today is Palm Sunday. We are one week away from the greatest Sunday in our calendar and uh, the greatest day in history. We're celebrating Jesus' resurrection from the dead. We're going to sing some songs today to talk about that. Randy's going to read through the uh, Palm Sunday story in just a little bit. And then Michael is going to come and preach uh, the final sermons um, of the series, Lead Me to the Cross, as we've been getting closer and closer to Easter, as we've journeyed through the Old Testament stories that lead us to the cross of Jesus. So that's where we're at. Glad you're here. Let's stand together, church family. I'm glad you're part of this today. Here we go. Fresh take on the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's lift our praises to Jesus now. We sing, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's sing that again. Praise God from Could you give them a warm welcome as they come? Kids Jam Choir. They're going to sing a special song, but they wanted to join us on this first. Go. Praise God, come all blessings flow. And Miss Jan is going to come out and tell us a little bit about what's going on. 
We're not sure what's going on, but we're going to do our best. If I could have my worship team come in the front, girls. Thank you. And then everybody else move up a little bit more now so all, all the moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas and friends can see you. Good morning. We are excited to be here on the Sunday that begins Holy Week. And this is the most important week in a Christian's life. It is the week that begins with praise, which we're going to bring here in just a minute. And um, near the end of the week, it gets pretty solemn because uh, Jesus came to fulfill his gift of love to all of us. But we get to end in rejoicing next Sunday because he has won. And that's what we're here to sing about this morning, that um, Jesus has won the victory. And we're excited about that. And because he's won, because we have Jesus in our hearts, he's our forever friend, we have the victory too. And we've won. chosen one, he's the champion, the winner for all time, with me to the end, Jesus is my friend, he's always by my side, anything I face, he will be my strength, I'm his and he is mine, I'm forever free, nothing's stopping me, because he gave his life, shout it out! Well, that was awesome. We need more Kids Jam songs on the stage. Would you guys come back and sing another song with us sometime? Good. I hope so. We'll bring you back. We'll bring you back. But for now, you got to leave. Just kidding. Uh, you guys have way more fun upstairs. Kids Jam with Jana and her volunteers is incredible. Uh, they do an incredible ministry here week after week after week. And we sometimes forget their... They're up there doing their thing, learning about Jesus. But it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so thanks for sharing that song with us, kids. Church, let's stand. We're going to continue to sing some songs about Hosanna. The word that the people shouted as Jesus came into town says, God save us. And that's our prayer today. Here we go. Don't 
my praise rises up and here we go. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring up in this place. Let's go. church let's sing that again in your presence when we see you we find strength to face the day yeah. in your presence all our fears are washed away they're washed away now the book of uh, the account of Hosanna, the story of all that in the book of Luke. 
After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village at heaven view, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw on their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When it came near the place where the road goes, down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one another, one stone on another, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Powerful story. If only you had known what would bring you peace. And we know today Jesus fulfilled that. He's the God of peace, the God of hope, the way, the truth, and the life. And that's what we're singing about now. Generation.
we surrender our hearts to you. As we lift you on high, we sing, Hosanna, save us. And Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Lord, we sing. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Oh, lead me. Lead me to the cross. Just take a moment or two here just to quiet your hearts and ask the Lord to speak to you. As you surrender yourself, your will, your desires to his, Lord, we lay ourselves down so you can be lifted up. We cry out, Hosanna, Hosanna, God, save us. We need you desperately. Let's sing that chorus. Lead me to the cross. Lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Speak to our hearts now, Lord, as we open your word. May your truth overwhelm us, your goodness and kindness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, church. You can have a seat. Good morning. Good morning. As always, it's good to be with you guys this morning. What an honor it is to open up the scriptures with you. If you have your Bibles, would you please open them to Numbers chapter 21? You heard me right. We're going to be in Numbers this morning. Yep. <clears throat> numbers chapter 21, uh, verses 4 through 9. We only got five verses we're covering this morning, but I promise you it will take the entire time. And so uh, as we're getting closer and closer to Easter, uh, we're doing this sermon series called Lead Me to the cross, where we explore the profound connections between the Old Testament signs in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Because if you look, we can see throughout Scripture ancient symbols that point to the ultimate sacrifice on the cross 
reminding us of God's faithfulness and his plan for salvation. And the goal the entire time, as has been, been for every speaker, including myself, is to dive deep into the significance of these signs and allowing them to guide us to the cross where we can find hope, forgiveness, and eternal life in Jesus. And so in this sermon from Numbers 21, we see how God's provision of the bronze serpent illustrates the seriousness of sin as well as our helplessness and total dependence on God. And like the Israelites, we are often faithless and unthankful, twisting God's good gifts. And when adversity comes, our default is to grumble and to complain. So just as the Israelites had to look at the bronze serpent to live, we must, too, look to God's ultimate provision for sin, putting our faith in Christ alone for salvation. Got it? That's the overview of what we're about to get into this morning. We're setting the tone of what we're about to get into. All right. <clears throat> so we are randomly jumping into the book of Numbers. So I want us to give uh, some historical context here before we dive into our text. When you come to Numbers 21, Israel has been in the wilderness for now almost 40 years. The issue in this chapter is about uh, complaining and grumbling by the sons of Israel against God and against Moses. I say again, it's been 40 years, and it's still about grumbling and complaining. Nothing's different. The new generation is doing this exact same thing as the old generation that got them into the wilderness. And so what, ha what had happened was this. <clears throat> Israel was getting near to the time that they were going to enter into the promised land. So they wanted to pass through the land of Edom in order to get to the land. But Edom controlled the trade routes, and passing through their territory was the most direct passage. So Moses sent emissaries to request permission from the Edomites to pass through their land, saying, hey, we will only stand or stay on the king's highway. We will take nothing. But the Edomites refused. They didn't let, them, let Israel pass through their land. In fact, they said, if you come into our land, into our territory, we will come out and meet you with a large force. This was very discouraging. This was very disheartening to hear because if you remember, the Edomites were direct descendants of Esau. Jacob and Esau were brothers, so Israel saw the Edomites as their brothers. Like this is very disheartening to hear because the, uh, the Israel did not wish to fight them. They didn't want to fight their brothers, so what did they do? They turned around and they went south. They went so far south to go around the land of Edom, traveling so far to pass near the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba. In other words, that's basically driving... 30 hours to get to your location, see that you can see the sign and say, nope, you can't pass through here. So you have to go 20 hours back that way and go around. So they became very impatient on the journey. And many commentators believe that this time of year was the hottest time of the year. But frankly, any time of the year in that part of the world would be difficult. It's hot. It's a wilderness. It's a desert. And they went very, very far out of the way. So in their complaining, the people spoke against God. They accused God in it. They spoke against Moses with the same complaint that we've heard many times. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Well, then they insulted God even further. Hey, there is no bread. There is no water. But there was. Then they took their complaining to new heights when they said, we detest this miserable food. And right there, they're speaking about the miraculous provision that God gave to them. I mean, how do you feed two million people in the desert for 40 years? By a miracle, by providing of this manna. It was wonderful in taste and very good for them, very nutritious. And now they say, hey, we detest this miserable food. And so God uses difficulties and adversities to prepare for what he knows is coming into your life. He's building character. He is strengthening your faith. So I like to ask this question when I look at what's happening here in the book of Numbers. What did God expect? I mean, what did he want? What did he expect? Well, he expected them to persevere. He expected them to endure. He expected them to master the wilderness before the wilderness mastered them. You see, God uses difficulty and adversities to bring about spiritual maturity. Wouldn't it have been so much better if they would just responded by saying, yes, this is hard, this is adversity, but God is preparing us for that which he has promised to give us is yet to come. To stand firm would have been such a glorious declaration. All right, so now we're caught up. So starting in verse 4, let's read it. We're going to read it all, and we're going to break it down like usual. Starting in verse 4. They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. 
they spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. So then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, and pay attention here, this is key. This is actually a shift into something that's good. It says here, we sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. So pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And pay attention to this. This is also a very key text here in verse 8. It said, the Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at that bronze snake, they lived. So Moses made a bronze serpent. He sat on a pole. And it came about if any man who was bit by a serpent could look at this bronze, bronze snake on a pole and live. This is very, very monumental in the history of Israel. And there's actually a lot for us to apply in our lives in this text. But I would like to begin with the understanding of human nature. Let's start off with this way and maybe say it like this. Complainers complain. It's the nature of the complainer to complain. There's always something to complain about. A tree is known by its fruit. The root of discontentment, complaining is the heart. Complainers complain. But here's what I want us to see in this story. Okay? It's, it's very specific. These are the children. This is the new generation. These are the children of the complainers, the old generation, that got them into the wilderness. So in other words, here's the question. Does the new generation have to do what the old generation did? Do the sons really have to be like their fathers? Listen, if you've had a great father, then praise God for that. Stand on his shoulders and be even greater. But if you had difficulty with your father, and people, many people have like myself, the question still remains, must it be? Do we have to carry on those sins, or can it end? I like to point at this uh, passage in Numbers uh, 14 and 18. It says, uh, it says this, Moses is quoting the Lord here, and he says, The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, what does that mean? I tell you, it's been misinterpreted for a long time. Many presume it means that he will take the sins of the father and put them on the children up to the third and fourth generation. That's not what this means. What this does mean, though, is that he will visit the children to see, hey, does this thing continue? Is the sin still remaining in the third and fourth generation? Because, you know, listen, children of alcoholics oftentimes become alcoholics. In my case, what I've seen with my family, children of drug addicts often become drug addicts, drug addicts themselves. Every single one of my cousins followed their aunts and uncles who are now either dead or in prison. My father and mother both were major drug addicts to the point where it had taken both of their lives. Children of those who are abusers oftentimes become abusers themselves. So the question still remains, does this thing need to keep going from generation to generation or can it end? I tell you, one of the most... A glorious revelations that ever came into my life uh, when I was a young man, I understood the Lord pressing into me at uh, this point. No, you do not have to carry the sins of the Father with you anymore. This thing can end and it can end with you. This is the generation that it will stop. And so it did. And it's true for you as well. I don't know what you're carrying that you brought with you from your Father, but I can tell you this morning that it can end and it can end with you. It can end right now because God is the one that's doing the work in you. And that is what he has shown us to apply in our lives right off the bat here. It's this, to rise above your circumstances. Because there is a bigger picture. There is something deeper at work. There's a greater spiritual meaning in life. But for some people, they only live in the moment. And they live according to their circumstances. So if their circumstances are good, then they feel good. If their circumstances are bad, then they complain. There's a deeper work. There's a greater picture. Okay, so Israel, they were... They were weary. They were impatient. They were tired. They had to turn south, right? That's not the right direction, and that made them discouraged. They were threatened by their brothers. But here's the thing. It's one thing to complain, but it's a whole different thing to complain against God so as to accuse him. Really, Jesus, he gave a parable that really did explain the condition of man and the problem of the heart. He said, the word of God being sown is like a farmer sowing his seed on different types of soil. So there are different types of the heart. The heart that is hard 
cannot receive the word of God at all. But the next type of soil, the next type of heart is the heart that I want us to see. He said on that type, the soil is quite thin. Because of the rocks in it, it is quite thin. So it does receive the word. In fact, it even receives the word with joy. But when the heat comes, see, it has no depth of root. So when the heat comes, it withers. So in other words, when adversity comes, when persecution arises, when difficulty comes, they shipwreck their faith because they accuse God and they are offended. You say you're a Lord. You say you're a Lord, but look at the troubles of my life. And they accuse God in this. For those who have a heart to complain, there's always something to complain about. Because guess what? There's always something wrong. We live in a broken world. And I'll tell you right now, no matter which direction you look, there's always something wrong. There's always something to complain about. But the question is this. Can you rise above your circumstances? Well, there are other people who always seem to find that which to be thankful for. They know that there's a deeper meaning in life. There are greater things, and they are thankful. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I'm sure you've seen that on a mug or maybe it's hung up on your wall in your house, but do you actually know what this means? It means this. In other words, learn to be content. That's hard. It's a spiritual point of maturity. You see, if Israel cannot learn to be content, they will not be content with anything. If they cannot master the wilderness, the wilderness will master them. But if they can learn to be content in God, they can be content anywhere. Do you catch that? You see why that is so important and can save you a lifelong journey of exhaustion, trying to find contentment in anything else besides God. You could look. You could dig as far as you want. You're not going to find it. And really, at the heart of it, Paul said that he's learned the secret of being content. He said in Philippians 4, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am, whether he has much or little whether I have abundance or suffering need. He said, this is it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is the strength of my heart. He is the strength of my life. I can be content in him even when I am suffering and can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. That's tough. And listen, it's a tremendous lesson whenever I have the opportunity to speak to young people, which is quite often being a youth pastor, but particularly single people in their lower 20s. I want to help them see the spiritual lesson of contentedness because single people oftentimes have the idea in their mind that if they could just be married, all the problems of their life will be solved. No doubt the ones who are laughing are married. No doubt. You know it doesn't solve all the problems of life. Here's the thing that is so important to grasp because it is a spiritual principle. If you are contented in your singleness, you will not be contented. If you are not contented in your singleness, you will not be contented married. But if you are contented in your singleness and contented in God, then you are going to bring that contentedness into your marriage. You're going to bring a maturity in Christ and you will find that you can rise above your circumstances. So the key is to learn to be content in God. For when your soul is content in God, you can rise above your circumstances and know that God is always doing a greater thing. That's why when we look at Numbers 21 as a tremendous application. When we recognize this principle, and we'll break it down, agree with God and acknowledge. Something monumental happens in these verses. So God sends venomous serpents among them, or some versions may say fiery. More than likely, they were called fiery because they were poisonous. Their bite would burn painfully, and then it says, many died. And in fact, there are many serpents and snakes and vipers in that region. And God may well have been keeping them away from Israel in their journeys, but now they're complaining and has brought them face to face with the reality of their sin. So there's the serpent. And the viper has been a, a symbol in the scriptures, it's been a symbol of sin, a symbol of judgment. When Satan appeared in the Garden of Eden, he came as what? A serpent. The point is, is that sin is poisonous. It is a mortal wound and there is no cure. It is. It's a mortal wound and there is no cure except for one. Except and only one that which God himself has provided. That's why the serpent is a powerful representation here. It's a powerful picture of that mortal wound of sin. In the book of Acts, there's a picture of this very contrasting thing to this. It's so interesting in its contrast 
We have to bring it up. We have no choice. It says in the book of Acts that Paul, taken as a prisoner to Rome, he's on a ship. On this ship being taken to Rome to stand before Caesar as a prisoner of Rome, they encounter a storm. Two weeks they're in this storm. At the end of which they sense that they're near land, so they begin to take soundings. Then they decide, because it's the black of night, to cast four anchors at 90 feet. So then they waited for some light, for morning to come. And so when morning light came, they could see that there was a beach, so they decided to cut the anchors and make a run for that beach. But they struck fast against the reef, and the waves began to beat against the ship, and it destroyed it. So everyone had to cast into the sea, find planks or whatever to make it ashore. So all that just happened, right? They come onto the shore of Malta, and so they begin to build a bonfire. Now Paul, he's throwing branches onto the fire, and as he's throwing branches, a viper comes out of the fire and latches onto his hand. I think a lot of people in that moment would have panicked. Vipers have a tendency to do that in people. I know I would have panicked. Listen, I cannot stand snakes, let alone poisonous ones. It's terrifying. Here, a lot of people in Paul's situation would have been frustrated. They would have been offended at the Lord, and they would have shipwrecked their faith because they were offended. Lord, I've had it. I've had all I could take. Here I am. I'm serving you. I get attacked by a crowd. There's a plot to kill me. I sat in prison in Caesarea for two years. Then I get taken as a prisoner on the ship, and I'm in a raging storm for two stinking weeks, only to become shipwrecked. Then we get saved onto this island. But what should happen now? But a viper latches onto my hand. How much can a man take? You say you're God. You say you're Lord, but look at the troubles of my life. So they accuse God in it, and they shipwreck their faith. Many people would have reacted that way, but not Paul. He's been through so many trials, and he has seen the hand of God that he perseveres. It's not the first time he's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten with rods, left for dead. He's, he's endured time and time again. He knows the faithfulness of God. And after going through a raging storm for two weeks and shipwrecked, and now a viper latches onto his hand, what does he do? He shakes it off into the fire. So the people of Malta were shocked at this whole scene. They said, sin has found this man. Sin has found him out. While being saved from the judgment of the sea, yet he has been judged because the viper has latched onto his hand. His sin has found him out. So he shakes it off in the fire, and they watch to see if he will swell up and die. And nothing happens. He's fine. And it's an amazing declaration. And notice the contrast when you go back to Numbers 21. Here, Israel, they send fiery serpents. It's a mortal wound. They're hurting. They're, they're, they're dying. And then in verse 7, it says that Israel immediately recognizes their sin, and they ask Moses to intercede. Grable, I tell you, it's a wonderful day when someone acknowledges their sin. Why is that? That's the day that God is going to do something in that person's life. The day that they open their eyes, the day that they acknowledge, the day that they agree with God, that's a good day because they have turned their heart to heaven for hope. They acknowledge their sin, and you have to. There's a tremendous spiritual significance in the acknowledgement of sin. Notice uh, Psalm 32 verse 5 says this, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will, cover, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. That GMC is a good day, and it's very key. So Moses, he intercedes, uh, but, but God didn't simply remove the serpents. What he did, he gave them this amazing, powerful picture of the son who was to come, who would arise on the cross and take on the mortal wound. That's why this picture is so important for us because it really is to be applied for us today. Look to him. Look unto Jesus and be healed. That's what he's telling us. Listen, God told Moses to make a bronze serpent, set it on a standard, a pole of woodcraft lifted up for the people to look upon, and anyone who will look upon the serpent that is lifted up in the wilderness would live. God was giving them a prophetic picture of the cross of Jesus Christ and the healing of the mortal wound. For there is no cure outside of the provision that God made through his son. So clearly, the serpent is a picture of their sinfulness. It's a picture of their own mortality. It's a picture of their complaining, of their discontent, and their bitterness that was in their heart. 
It represents the sting of death, and it's a picture of the same thing for you and I. For sin is a mortal wound today, just as it was then. It's a picture of our discontent in this, our bitterness, the sting of death on us. But Jesus is the one that said that the serpent lifted up is a picture of himself. This comes right out of John chapter 3. John chapter 3 being the one of the most powerful chapters in the Bible. And the situation is this. A leader of the Jews, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, comes to Jesus at night. He says, Rabbi, we know that you are from God. Now, right there, that's an amazing statement. We know that you are from God, for no one could do the things that you do unless God was with him. So then Jesus began to speak to him about being born again and the life that comes from the Spirit. That brings us to verses 14 and 15, where Jesus himself is teaching now and said this incredible word. Just as Moses lifted up the snake of the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus clearly said that there's a similarity between what Moses did here and what Jesus did on the cross. How can a serpent illustrate Jesus? Serpents are often used as pictures of evil in the Bible. You see it in Genesis 3 and Revelation 12. However, bronze is a metal associated with judgment in the Bible. Because bronze is made how? Passing through fire. So the ancient Hebrews connected bronze with something that has survived the fires of judgment. So a bronze serpent speaks of evil, but evil that has been judged. Just as Jesus, who knew no sin, who became sin for us on the cross, and our sin was judged in Jesus. Do you see the similarity now? That brings us to the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3, 16, 17. It said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Many people, of course, know John 3, 16, but they don't know that it follows verse 15, where Jesus called himself the serpent of sin. It's a powerful understanding, and it has everything to do with life that comes from God. Let me give you another verse. And this is one of those verses in the Bible to underline or memorize it. It's that important. It comes from 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says this. God made him who had no sin to be sin. Talking about Jesus clearly here. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He was the serpent lifted up in the wilderness. He took the mortal wound. He became sin on our behalf, but then it adds something. It adds that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's amazing. What a glorious exchange. He took the mortal wound that we deserved. He became the serpent of which paid the price, the penalty of our sin. And what did he give to you in exchange? The very righteousness of God found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we recognize this great truth. Hey, God did did what we can never do. God did what we could not do. The people are dying. They cannot heal themselves. They have that mortal wound. The snakes bit them. But God gave to them that provision that anyone who will look could have life. And he does the same for us today. Romans 8.3 says this, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Now that's a powerful statement because what the law could not do because it was weak because of the flesh, God did it himself by what? Sending his own son and the likeness of the sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. What was it that the law could not do? Couldn't make you righteous. That's, what, that's why this understanding is so powerful. He becomes the serpent to take the mortal wound that we deserve. Listen, the sting of death is gone. And what does he give to you in exchange? The very righteousness of God. This is the greatest news that this world can ever hear. Now that brings us to our final point as we close with this. Simply look with eyes of faith in order to be healed. In order to live, the people simply and only needed to look upon the serpent lifted up in the wilderness. Did you know the serpent on the tree has become a symbol of healing even today? You go across doctor's offices all across the world and you will see a serpent uh, on a tree. You will go uh, see ambulances all across the world and you see a serpent on the tree. But it's just a symbol. The symbol doesn't heal. The symbol's not life. It's what God has done for you where you get life. It's what God has done when he sent his son. So simply look to him and believe. I love this passage 
uh, the author says this in Hebrews 12, 2, says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fix your eyes on Jesus and only Jesus. Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Turn to Jesus and only Jesus. You know, we might be willing to do 100 things to earn our salvation, but God only commands us to trust in him, to look to him. When Israel complained against the Lord and against Moses, they did not look to the Lord as they should. What, what did they do instead? They looked at themselves. They looked at their hard circumstances, but they did not look to the Lord. So let me ask you this. What will it take to get you to look to the Lord? Let me ask you another question. What must a person do to be lost? Nothing. They're already lost. What must a person do to be saved? Simply and only look to him who took the mortal wound himself that you might have life and have it abundantly. He's the answer. He's the only answer. He's the answer to emptiness, lostness, death, lack of hope, loneliness, lack of meaning. He is the answer. Look and simply believe that God has made a way because he did. That's the true meaning of what this week is all about. Today is Palm Sunday, the start of Holy Week. And Holy Week signifies this week of Jesus' life from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday 2,000 years ago when he changed everything. He changed the world forever. He changed eternity forever. And my strong encouragement to you is not let this week be a, just a normal week. Take extra time in your devotions. Take extra time to invite people to our services for Holy Week. And take extra time to commemorate as a family because important things are worth commemorating. And there is absolutely nothing that's more important than what Jesus did this week 2,000 years ago. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. What can we say? You are amazing what you have done for us. You give us hope. You take our mortal wound. We love you. We, we thank you. We, honor. we honor, you, honor you for all that you've done for us, God. We praise you that faith, looking and believing in what you have said and what you have done is the way to be saved from our sins. God, we praise you that we don't have to work to try and earn your favor. We praise you that you have provided a way for us to be saved from our rebellion by your grace, by what you have done for us. Even today, right now, we look to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Whew, thank you, Michael. That's a powerful, powerful message of hope. I hope you've enjoyed going through this series. I've loved it, looking back at these stories of the Old Testament and seeing how they carry through the sacred scarlet thread from the very first word of Scripture all the way through points to Jesus. And that's what this next song is about. So let's stand together, church. So we look and even sing about some of these stories we've learned about in this series. I'm calling on the God of Jacob Whose love endures through generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses Opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. Just cry out to the Lord as you sing, My God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. I'm standing on your faithfulness. Thank you, God. You're faithful time and time again. Call on the Lord together. We sing. I'm calling on the God of man. Favor rests upon the Lord. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous.
we'll sing this truth to the Lord. You heard us. Come on. You heard your children then. You hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then. And you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are providing that. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same healer, Lord. On you, Holy Spirit, fill us up and pray. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit, Almighty, Almighty River, come and fill me. Come fill me again. Come fill me. And that's our prayer, Lord Jesus. Fill up our hearts, empty us of ourselves, and fill us up with more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, you can have a seat for just a moment or two. Test, test. That's hot. Um, good morning. Michael, thank you. Um, we had a Seder last night. And many of us walked out of there with a red string tied around our wrist. Around it, is yours on your wrist? Yeah. And what we were so interested in is finding where Jesus Christ is presented in the Old Covenant. And what Michael shared today, it, from Luke 24, there's a passage where on the road to Emmaus, Jesus said to the two disciples, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scripture the things concerning himself. And that's what we're after is the scarlet thread from the beginning of Genesis all the way through Malachi and then into the new covenant. And Michael gave us another image of the scarlet thread, the serpent lip lifted up. Today is Lamb Selection Sunday in the Hebrew context, so if you want another scarlet thread, read Exodus 12. It's when they selected a lamb for sacrifice. In the very same time they were selecting a lamb, Jesus came down the Mount of Olives into, into Jerusalem, and then they were supposed to observe this lamb they selected for blemish. Jesus was observed by Pontius Pilate and found to be without blemish. And then the very time they sacrificed the lambs on the altar, um, Jesus was sacrificed for us. Scarlet threads endlessly. And um, glory to God. Glory to God. Um, if I could um, give you an update in a couple of things, please. Um, I wanted to let you know that Mitch Chevrolet decided um, to resign from the, from the board at this time. So much going on in his life. Um, so many things. And the board is not the most important thing in our lives. You guys know that. Mitch is choosing what's most important. And Amanda, Leah, Mitch, um, Max, we love you guys. Um, Miss your husband a lot on the board. He's a dear friend, and we wish him the best. And he's where he needs to be, and we fully support that. 
Um, we asked Kevin Roth to fill that spot for us, and he's graciously allowed um, us to interact with him again. We love that dude as well. Um, and a quick update on the pastoral search. Um, we have invited um, Justin and his wife Paige to come in the next two to four weeks. We'll see what the timing is as an informal visit um, to meet with the uh, search team, the elders, the staff, as we continue to ask the question, and he asked the question, is this the place for us? Is this the leader for us for the next for the next steps? So we went, um, recently we've talked to his references. We went through a profile with him. We've unpacked as much as we can unpack, and we're gonna invite them to come and visit with us. After that step, if things are still going well, he'll come and visit more formally um, to be introduced to the congregation at large to preach. And if you are a member, there'll be a time, if it came to that, where you would vote um, for him to be or not to be our next lead pastor. So the initial steps are um, an informal uh, visit coming up in the next month as we can work all that stuff out. So we, we want your prayers. We need your prayers. We invite your conversation. Many of you have asked and um, sent comments to us, and we want more of that. Please do. Please comment. Please walk down this path with us. And yeah, we love this place immensely. Um, we love our staff immensely. Um, yeah, to him be the glory. We give you thanks. Thanks, Dr. B. So as we wrap up, just another reminder, we need you guys to continue to faithfully give. We have so much we want to do. It's so much we are doing. And we need, and we ask, we plead for your tithes and offerings. The Bible talks about giving of your first fruits, the first 10% of what you earn, set aside and give back to the Lord. And we ask you to prayerfully consider to support the ministry here at GMC. And this is a huge week. We talked about it a lot this morning. Coming up on Friday is our Friday, uh, Good Friday service. will be right here in the gym at 7 o'clock uh, where we get to really pause, reflect, and remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us. It's a really somber, really serious service. There is child care provided through pre-K. Um, but we ask that you come. We can't celebrate Easter Sunday without first stopping and pausing and remembering what Jesus went through on Good Friday and the cross. So if you haven't already, grab one of the invite cards for Easter Sunday. Next, the next week is the same service times in the chapel and in the gym as normal. Um, please invite somebody, bring them along. We want this place to be packed. We're going to celebrate. We're going to have a great time. But for now, it's time to go and be the church. Have an awesome week. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. I, I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God.